we were chosen by God and predestined for salvation and foreordained that we would be a set apart people. Being we are set apart, that means we have a different standard of living. Let's read together what 1 Peter teaches about living before God our Father. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray, Lord. We just pray that you would talk to us through your word, Lord, and open our eyes to the way you would have us live, being that we are your children, Lord, and that we should be set apart from the world. And just let us hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're to live a life of holiness. Verse 13, where it was talking about gird your loins, Peter's audience would have been familiar with this expression because people in that day, they had to gather up their robes. So they had these big, long robes that they'd trip over. And they'd have to take these robes and tuck them into their belt so that they wouldn't trip. So that's what it means by when he's talking about gird your loins. And people in this day, like the people back then, we have to take our thoughts and we have to guard our thoughts and tuck our thoughts so that they don't wander astray and lead us astray. Like these people do with their clothing, Peter, Peter is saying we should discipline our minds and focus our thoughts on God's grace so we're not tripping over things we shouldn't. It's easy to allow our thoughts to run wild with selfish desires and foolish things that steal our focus from God, right? We must keep our eyes on the prize and focus our minds on the grace of God and his blessings so we're not letting our minds just run wild with things. You know, you can, you can overthink a situation and you can think about a situation the wrong way but being we're children of God and we're his chosen people, we should keep our thoughts in check. The verse goes on to say, be sober, which is referring to self-control and not just being drunk and in your thoughts being loose, but keep it controlled and be alert, have an alert state of mind. Do not allow your mind to reach out and reach the state that your thoughts are clouding your focus and separating you from God because they can do that. The mind's a very powerful thing. Be alert. Scripture tells us the enemy is waiting for us. You know, he's sitting in the sidelines hoping that you think of something that's going to throw you off your game and then he'll jump on you. The Bible says he's sitting like a roaring lion ready to jump and attack. He waits for a moment of weakness and then he'll act on us and grab a hold of us. That's why we've got to keep our mind focused and keep our mind girded. Let's look back at verse 14. It says, As obedient children, not conforming to yourselves, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, not conforming yourself to the former lusts. So, before we were children of God, we must have had different things that controlled us, right? 
Now that we are children of God, we're aware of these things, and we're aware of the things of God, and we're aware of things that are not of God. We are not ignorant to these things. We can understand whether or not what we're doing is of God. There were things that I used to be okay with before I was a child of God that I'm not okay with now. Some of these things I don't even want to be in the same room with. If, you know, we, we used to be able to go somewhere and it didn't matter what they said or what they talked about or what they were doing, we were just kind of doing our own thing and we'd be in the same room and it was okay. But now my spirit don't even want to be around that kind of evil and it, it throws off a balance. And you know what it is? That's because God's living in me and I'm aware. And God lives in you and you're aware. And you have to pay attention to those things. Yes? Isn't that what discernment is? Like five, three, three, yep. That's discernment is a big part of that. So we we use discernment and that's that's how you know God puts that gift in you once you become a child of God. And you can discern whether something's bad or not or whether you're you're in a bad situation or you're somewhere you shouldn't be. We have been called out of ignorance into the knowledge of Christ. We must keep our thoughts and our actions in check and not allow them to conform to our old ways. So, you know, if you used to have a drinking problem and then you became a child of God and you felt like you didn't need to drink, then all of a sudden you start letting a little drink here and a little drink there, what could happen? It can make you become an alcoholic because the devil's going to use that weakness that you let back into your your sphere that surrounds you. You let that back in and the devil can use that because he's like a <laughs> roaring lion, a prowling, prowling lion. He uses things like that, or, or there's other things, like if you're a gossiper and you feel like you got away from gossip, then the Lord, you know, the devil will use that if you let yourself get back in that situation. We must keep our thoughts and our actions in check and not allow them to conform to our old ways. As Christians... There is a principle that Jesus gave us that relates to our response to salvation. In his parable of the faithful steward, Jesus told his audience, from everyone who is given much, much will be required. So what does that mean? So when you come to salvation, you give your life over to the Lord, right? You give everything. At that point, you're committing yourself to be God's. But guess what? That doesn't mean it's over with and you're done right there, right? From that point on, you have to start living in this world like a godly person. You have to, you have to be able to not put yourself in, in worldly situations. You have to be able to set yourself apart. So from him who is given much, much is required. And why is that? Because we're not people of the world anymore we're people of the body of christ we should be different we should act different we should look different people should know we're different from the way we act and what we do and how we are it's called your testimony john MacArthur says since no gift is greater than god's gift of forgiveness and salvation in jesus christ nothing can demand a greater response because he gave us the gift of salvation do we not owe him for us to act different? Do we not owe him to represent as children of God in a world where people don't? That is our response to being saved. That's our response to salvation. You just don't get salvation. And you're like, cool, God, see you in a few. Because then you can get sucked right back into the world. And who are you that are any different than anybody else in the whole world? You gossip, you drink, you do sexual things you shouldn't do, you steal. You can do that after you've given your life to God. 
but then you're allowing the world to bring you back in and to conform to your old ways. And that's what we're talking about here. The anticipation <coughs> of Christ's return, it motivates believers to live in holiness. It is a hope. Genuine hope results in purity of life or holiness. You know, some people are scared to talk about resurrection and Jesus coming back. Scared that I don't want to talk about this stuff because I don't want to hear about the end of the world and everything's going to go crazy and it's going to be all wild. But that's not the beauty of that. The beauty of that is that creates a fear inside of us that we don't know that God's going to show up. Jesus is going to come back in a cloud in five minutes for 50 years. You can walk out of here today and Jesus standing out there in the cloud coming to get us. Now, what did you do yesterday? How is he going to judge how you acted yesterday? Because you don't have time to fix that because Jesus is standing right there. Here we go. Right? That is the anticipation of Christ's return, and it creates in us a desire to live holy because you don't know when he's coming back, and you want to please him. You want Jesus to say, enter my gates. Verse 15 goes on to say, he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. You know whose words those are? God's. He said, be holy for I am holy. That wasn't a suggestion. That's telling us how he wants us to be. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus sets forth the same standard. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus, he told us we have to be perfect. Now, can we be perfect in this world? No, because we're in sinful flesh vessels. You know, we got the remnant of sin still on us. But as we've discussed, we've got to allow our minds to stay straight. You know, he wants us to be perfect. We're to strive to be perfect. We're never going to be perfect until we get to heaven, until we get to the other side of this thing. But we are to strive and to show others that we're children of God. His holiness is the goal in which we are equipped to aim, and we're equipped by the Word and the Spirit. So the Spirit of God lives in us, and He helps us decide what's holy and what's not. He opens our eyes to that, and the Word instructs us on how we should live. So the Bible says, don't sin, then you need to not sin. You need to do your best not to do that. Are you going to slip up? Yes, you're going to slip up. But you need to do your best not to. Every day you need to wake up and try again to be perfect and holy because that's what we're called to be. Back in the first part of the passage where it says we're to guard our thoughts and actions, it shows we're equipped to recognize holiness and worldliness and separating. So he says, guard your thoughts so you can do it. You have the ability to do it. You're equipped to do it. The Holy Spirit gives you that ability to be able to guard your thoughts and guard your actions, but you have to put it into action. And that's why he says, to who is given much, much is required. Because you have to every day wake up and you have to decide that that's what you're going to do. Every situation, you have to decide whether you're going to be of God or of the world. God desires us, his children, to practice holiness. Peter emphasizes this by showing that not only does God call for it, but he always has. What do you mean by that? Peter's reference to the OT, the Old Testament, and Israel's call to holiness drives this point. So God reiterates this command earlier in the Bible in Mosaic Law. In Leviticus chapter 11, God says, well, let's read it. Let's read it. We're going to open our Bibles here. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 11. I want you guys to see it for yourself. <clears throat> now, this is in the very front of the book. Leviticus chapter 11.
43. We're going to read 43 through 45. These are the words of the Lord. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So that's what he was saying to Israel when he delivered him from Egypt. This is how you're going to act. This is what their response should be to his gift of salvation to them from Egypt. That should be our response to him for Jesus' gift of salvation, it should be holiness. You see, God wants his children that he is, has a relationship with to want to be like him, to practice his holiness. So that's what we're to do. And then we move on to, to responding in honor. What is a healthy fear? You're scared not to walk on the edge of a building because why? If you fall off, what's going to happen? You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to get hurt. Is that a healthy fear? Yeah. That keeps you from walking on that edge, right? Because you don't want to fall. You don't want to sneak out at night from your parents' house because why? What will happen? <laughs> because the wrath of God will come upon you through your father for leaving the house at night. And you will be smitten. That's a healthy fear, right? And why, why does your father want you to not sneak out at night? Because he cannot protect you if he doesn't know that you're in his house, right? If you're not in his circle, he cannot protect you. If you're gone and he don't know where you're at, then there's danger. That is a healthy fear. <clears throat> what does fear produce? Well, it should produce a reverence. You should be reverent. You should be in awe when you have fear. Now, we're talking of God right here. So the fear of God should create reverence. We don't want to disrespect God. And God is almighty and all-powerful, so there is an all-created, and that also creates a respect. Hope and holiness, which is what we talked about up to this point, produce a life of worship. We're thankful. We're grateful. So we live in holiness. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the fear of the Lord is what drives you to think. It's what drives you to dig in and to know. God, God is our judge. He's keeping an account of how we conduct life on earth. The Bible teaches that at the revelation of Jesus Christ, there will be a judgment of all believers. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. That means one day we're going to be up there and then we're going to give an account of every thought and of every action. You know, the Lord's going to judge your thoughts. If you think it, he's going to judge it. Well, why did you think that way? That right there should create a fear inside of you. Not to think things that you shouldn't be thinking, right? How much more is actions? The Bible teaches that, that we're going we're gonna to have a day where we have to do this as believers and unbelievers. I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty deep. There's a lot of stuff that I've done in my life that I'm not proud of, that I really don't care to get brought up again. But it will. And it's going to happen. Every thought and every action will be judged. But guess what? If you believe in Jesus Christ and he's your Savior and Lord, 
then you're just going to have to give an account of it and you get to live in eternity after that. If Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, then after you've given that account, then you're going to have to go down and meditate it on the rest of your days, desiring that you were in heaven for eternity. And that's going to be in hell. So if we know that every thought and every action is going to be judged, how much more do you think the consequences are going to be for a Christian person that knows better and continues to ignore and live in sin and ignores the Holy Spirit, how much worse do you think his consequences are going to be at that time? I mean, that's going to be a deep regret that you're going through because you have lived and you have ignored the Lord and now you're having to give an account for that. That's pretty deep. That's that fear. That's a fear. That creates a fear, right? That should drive us to desire holiness and desire that everything we do is of God and that we can be proud of every thought and every action that we have. You going to screw up? Yes. You going to ask forgiveness? I hope so. Are you going to learn from it? I hope so. If you don't, then you're deliberately living that way and continuing to live in sin. The fear of God is healthy. It is what keeps his children between the lines, you know, like driving in a car. You keep the car between the lines. The fear of God keeps us between the lines and keeps us straight and keeps us going the speed limit. It drives us to a life of holiness. Now, verse 18 through 19, let's read that again. Back in 1 Peter. Knowing that you are not redeemed. I'm going to go to the verse before that. And you call, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. In fear, he's saying, stay here in fear. Use that fear to your benefit. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. What were we redeemed with? The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. This shows us the significance of our salvation. We were not purchased with things that are precious to this world like gold and silver, money. We weren't bought with that. We weren't bought with a car. We weren't bought with anything but what was precious to heaven. What we were bought with is precious to heaven. Think about the significance of that. What's precious to the angels, what's precious to God, that's what we were bought with. The blood of Christ, the blood of the almighty God himself is what paid for us so that we can live with him forever. Well, take a minute to dwell on that. We were bought with the blood of Christ. So I got a little story I'm gonna read you here. A boy once asked the wise man, what, what is the secret to success? What's the secret to success? And after listening to the boy's question, the wise man, he told the boy to meet him at the river in the morning and he'd give him the answer there. So the kid's wondering what success is and the old man says, come to the river and I'll show you what it is. In the morning, the wise man and the boy began walking towards the river and they continued on into the river past the point of where the water's covering their nose and their mouth. So they're in the water deep, right? They're up to here. And at this time, the wise man grabs the boy's head and shoves it in the water. And he's holding him down under the water. As the boy struggled to get out, the wise man continued to push him further. He pushed him deeper and deeper. And the boy felt a fish slip by his leg and squirmed to get up even harder. And the man eventually pulled the boy's head up so he could get air and the boy gasped and took the biggest breath of air. The wise man said, what were you fighting for when you were under the water? And the boy replied, air. I wanted air. And the man said, 
There it is. You have the secret to success. When you want to gain success as much as you wanted air when you were under that water, you will obtain it. That's the only secret. What's the moral of that story? Success, desire, it, it starts with the desire to achieve something. You got to want it. You got to fight for it. If your motivation is weak, you might as well give up because you're never going to get there. Think about what you desire the most in life and work towards getting it. Don't allow the environment or other people to influence the things you truly want. If you want it, you can get it. And the only person that can get it for you is you. But you're not going to do it unless you fight for it. Just because the fish swimming by that rubbed your leg while he was holding him under the water, just because the fish swimming by was comfortable being underwater doesn't mean that you are. Hmm. So that fish was just fine being underwater, but the boy was not, right? He had to fight to get out and get air. So we're going to be, we're going to be like that in life. Isn't that how it is in today's church and in, 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 in Christianity? Many Christians are satisfied with just calling themselves Christians and just being a part of a church. That's it for them. They've checked their two boxes off. They think that's it. You get to go to heaven. They don't desire success. They don't desire to please the Father, but they just, as long as they make themselves happy and check off the list, they're done. We're called to a much higher standard than the rest of the world. We should not be comfortable where we are, but we should always be seeking and, and always trying to find a life that is pleasing to God, which is not easy in this world. If you're doing it and it's easy, then you're doing it wrong. The Bible's told us over and over and over again, it's going to be hard. How do you get into heaven? The wide road that's easy to travel down? No. The narrow road that not many people are going to get through. The ones that get through it are the ones that are going to fight for it and believe it and want to get there. They're the ones that are going to guard their thoughts. They're the ones that are going to show that they are followers of God. They're going to show that they're believers of Christ. They're the ones that are going to show the rest of the world who they are. We have to actually fight for it. You don't just get saved and you're done. If that's what you choose, then the devil is going to drag you right back down to where you started from. He's going to pull you down and he's going to make you struggle the rest of your life. And you might be comfortable there. Is that pleasing to God? No. Is it pleasing to God that you call yourself a follower of Christ and you disrespect your parents? You think I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out to you like it is? Jesus comes right now. What are you going to say to him? Because it's going to happen. You guys got to know it's going to happen. It might not happen now. It might not happen in 10 years. Or it might happen in the next 30 seconds. And we're all going to be sitting there looking Jesus in the face. Telling him why we acted the way we acted. You got to gird your thoughts. You got to work for it. And you want to hope that when you get there, he says, enter into my kingdom. And find your rest. That ain't Jesus. That's the name. But Emma, yeah, Charles here. All right, give us a few more minutes. So I want you guys to think: Do we not owe Jesus our everything? Do we not owe Jesus our everything? The fact that you guys just freaked out like that. Long thought. I mean, think about that for a minute. The fact that you guys just freaked out that much when I was saying that, do you not know that's the Holy Spirit working in your heart right now? Saying you better start acting right and thinking right? 
That is called conviction. That's the same thing you get when you do something you know you're not supposed to do. Conviction is healthy. Conviction creates the fear that drives us between the lines. Should we not guard our thoughts and actions? If you guard your thoughts, your actions are going to follow. If you guard yourself against thinking about things that are not of God and how you should not be acting, you're going to follow with your body. We should display a life of holiness in gratitude that the entire world sees. People should walk up to you without a doubt in their mind and say, that is a church, Bible-thumping, Christian person. Not that that is Jason Ketchum who plays rock music, and he's very good at that. What I want to be represented is, is that's Jason Ketchum that, man, he loves Jesus. That's what I want. That's what you guys should want. And we show that through gratitude. So as we go out and we do our thing, you guys are in school. You guys should show it in school. You should not jump into the gossip and talking about each other and talking about other people because you should be guarding your thoughts against that. You should not care if someone's talking junk about you because who do you belong to? God Almighty. Who cares what the people of this world think? Who cares? You should be able to lay in your bed every night and feel good about what you did today. And you should analyze that every night. What did I do today? What can I do different tomorrow that I didn't do today? Where did I screw up? And then you should ask the Lord to forgive you for that. And you should start tomorrow noon. You have the power inside of you to do that. You have the power inside of you to move an entire mountain if you had that much faith. It's already in you. It's already in you. But if you don't use it, what good is it? You got to put your faith into action. You got to put your love into action. You got to put your gratitude into action. So go this week and show the love of God. Show and guard your actions. Show holiness. Show love. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that you would give us your word and you would give us instructions that we could live by, Lord. You make it easy for us, and all we have to do is to fight for it and put it into action. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our eyes to that. Holy Spirit, just lead us. Lead us through every situation and guide our thoughts and guide our minds and guide our actions, Lord, and, and show us when we're doing wrong and things not of you so that we know, Father God, and just let it burn inside of us so much that we can just, we, we have to stay away from it, Lord. And we just pray that you would bless us this week and keep us all safe. And we pray for Pete as he's got his surgery coming up, Lord. And we pray that if it was in your will, that he'd show up and he wouldn't even need the surgery, Lord. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.